Oh. Oh no. Why would you not link the article? Wait, hold on. He might have made a comment. I linked it. Okay. <sighs> You're lucky. You're lucky. By Rachel Janfaza. Hey, dude, off topic, but in the past, how'd you learn to maneuver toxic relationships without allowing guilt trips to prey on your emotions? My ex um, herself after I wanted space. She's blaming me slash not letting me move on. Wait, she killed herself and now she's blaming you for herself? I don't understand. What? Alex Mahad uh, Mahadevan, who works to debunk misinformation as the director of Media Wise at the Pointer Institute, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization said young people's increased trust in the online chatting cla or chattering class rather than in the mainstream media was a problem because content creators, unlike most journalists, are bound by no journalistic ethics. That pertains to people across the political spectrum. Hassan Piker, a popular left-leading streamer on Twitch and YouTube, shares as much misinformation as anyone on the right. Oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, no. Oh, ho, oh, oh, no. I'm not here, am I? Oh, okay. Oh no! Oh oh! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no no no! Oh, no no no! Uh oh! Huh? The voices young conservatives are listening to online. What? It's funny. He's only getting this linked because he wants to see his name in it. There's no shot that he would read an article longer than like 180 characters. <laughs> Alex Mahadevan, who works to debunk misinformation at the director of uh, Point. Oh, hold on. Just as a quick thing. His next step here, <laughs> the reason why I was late today, again, it's because I was pre-watching everything. The next step for what Hassan is going to do is he's going to Google this guy's name, go through his Twitter, and then he's going to Google the uh, company and go through their Twitter to see if he can find anything that looks even remotely not supportive of progressivism on the whole. And then he's going to call them Nazis or genocide supporters or whatever he can find to link them to a bad particular thing. And then he's going to write them off and move on from there. There you go. Institute, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Wait, what? Who the fuck is this dickhead? He said, I, he said, I share as much misinformation as anyone on the right. Oof. A nonpartisan nonprofit organization said young people's increased trust in the online chattering class rather than mainstream media was a problem because, bro, you have to be on crack cocaine to have this take. was a problem because content creators like unlike most journals are bound by journalistic ethics that pertains to people across the political spectrum Hassan Piker a popular left-leaning streaming uh, streamer on Twitch and YouTube shares as much misinformation as anyone on the right he added Mr. Maha Devon said the preference for content that a firm belief stem from what he called the core human desire the need for validation <laughs> oh no show me this motherfuckers Twitter right now Hold on. Player piano. Thank you for the tank of subs. What the fuck is this dipshit talking about? It's going to be something about Israel. What the That's my guess. What the absolute fuck is something this about dipshit Israel. talking about? And this dumb fuck follows me too. Find something to discredit him. Let's go. Something Dumb up. centrist fuck. Oh, okay, centrist. Okay, okay. True. Okay, keep going. Keep going. I like that he waited for the end of the open. Okay, keep going. Don't worry. You'll find something to write him off. You can do it. You can do it. Bro, in an article. Do you agree with the article's claim as a whole? Like, does Hassan share as much misinfo as someone like Tim Pool? Yes, absolutely. Or maybe more just because of the raw amount of hours that he streams. Um, like Tim Pool shares as much misinformation as possible, but I think Hassan does as well. I mean, like, if you want to see the quality of the man, I mean, like, this is Hassan's style of research.
How many Twitter threads do we have open today? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 Twitter threads today. Wow. And this open tab right here might be 20. If that, oh, no, no, that's the article. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, this is, yeah, Hassan is a, a, um, hit the miss, he's pervasive when it comes to spreading misinformation. Where they're talking about, like, people consistently, consistently yep. Yep. in an article where you are talking about right-wing sentiment and how much misinformation plays in yep. the right-wing sphere yep. to turn around and be like, you know, actually, there's a guy out there who's, you know, reporting on said misinformation. Duck Festiny Fan 1, thanks for the 10 gifted subs. Me, and addressing it with empirical evidence. That's love that the yeah never happening. I love that the fucking Pointer Institute. Oh, hold on. Top funders of Pointer Institute. Oh, here we go. Fucking idiotic. Maybe military industrial complex. What can we find? Come on, you can find something. Oh wait. <clears throat> Do you think that politics streamers not being bound by journalist ethics is an actual issue? Yeah, of course, it's a huge issue. Uh, alternative media is dog shit when it comes to sourcing or ethics or anything like that. Yeah, one hundred percent. Have him on the defense take. I do want to have him on the defense take. <laughs> oh, now he wants to debate this guy. Oh my lord, he's gonna say the Ukraine thing, the hospital bombing thing. That's good enough for him to call you a misinformation spreader. Do not interact with these weirdos. This just seems like you're whining. Ooh, uh oh. Okay, you know what? What the fuck am I doing? This loser has 2,000 fucking Twitter followers and works for a fucking right-wing, or right -wing? hyper centrist think tank. Oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. Anyway. You're going to blow him up? You said your name on purpose? Yeah. yeah top got donors it. from the Charles Koch Institute. The Stand Together Fellows there you from the go. Charles Koch Institute. There we go. Koch okay. brothers. Yep. Far right. We got him. <laughs> we can ignore this, guys. No, you're not wanting You take your news accuracy seriously. Unless some fucker questions that, of course, you're upset. Yeah, no. We got him. He's very pro-Israel too in all of his writings. Yeah, that's probably why he's saying. That's probably why he's saying I'm spreading misinformation because I think he, Palestinians are human beings. Got the Dude, Israel thing. Shut the thing fuck up with this dumb poop sock, brother. Are you a fucking child? The New York Times. This this asshole is on the fucking New York Times being like, oh, this dude is spreading as much misinformation. Most of my commentary <laughs> hyper focuses on fucking right wing misinfo. The people mm -hmm. that this article is literally about. People that I've directly called out for spreading misinformation. And this centrist coke back think tank guy goes in and is like, oh, actually the left is spreading misinformation as well. Yeah, you're right, dude. Extremely both sides. I don't know how I do it. I'm sorry, guys. What are you doing? Why are you posting your own fucking tweets? It's hard to pre-watch reality. Now we just need to say it was a DGG or <laughs> he's a secret DGG. -er. There's nothing more frustrating than a shitty, supposedly centrist liberal, okay, operating in a fucking supposedly centrist think tank that gets money from the Koch brothers or the Koch brother now, okay, that turns around and both sides the shit. It's like just say it with your chest. Like who the fuck wrote this article, dude? How are you on crack? You just, you just didn't like I got a mention, but I didn't get a fucking call. That's crazy. Fucking bad journalism, in my opinion. <laughs> True. Mr. Mahadevan said the premise for content affirm belief stems from what he calls core human desire, the need for validation. Confirmation, bias, and motivated reasoning are so powerful in humans, he said. We want to believe the facts that confirm what we think. Oh, yeah. Mr. Mahadevan added that the way some people selectively consumed mainstream media news was exemplified after the shooting of Mr. Trump at Camping Rally in Pennsylvania on Saturday. What did I do? Most of what I did after he got shot was literally actively cast aside misinformation and explain to people media literacy. This is most of what I do is media literacy. Media literacy. Unreal. How many Twitter tabs do we have open here? I'm curious. Can anybody go through? Well, you know what? Fuck it. I got nothing better to do. Do you think we can find him reading a full article a single time today? Because he's got like four or five articles open. I wonder if he ever has read an, a, a full news article. Let's check. Okay. Well, we've got watching him on a show. Tweets. Tweets. Camera. YouTube video. YouTube video, tweets, YouTube video, or tweet, actually, tweet video. Oh, we brought up an article. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Is he reading an article? Okay. Huh. Anyway, the line of low. Oh my God, he might be. Oh my God, he might be reading an like article. Like I said, I'm, I, these are the reasons why I'm, I am, uh, you know, Bashar pilled. Here's the AFLC. Bashar pilled? Not Bashar al Assad. Wait, what is he? What was he saying? I don't, don't know, don't, I don't want to know. I also writing in 2023 November. If we don't have Bashar back in there, we won't have a firewall anymore. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. Okay, Something, okay I, don't, I don't know what the fuck this is. Andy Bashar, okay. I'm so scared that they're going to go with fucking Pete Buttigieg, though. Now, that's a motherfucker who's not pro-labor. Okay? He doesn't have the instinct. He only fights in a, in a way that appeals to liberals. 
He's just, he, he is basically our JD Vance. He's got more charisma than JD Vance, but that's not saying much because JD Vance is like a Donald Trump Jr. style. Uh, <laughs> what? Pick. Huh. Anyway, the line of Louisville, baby. Okay, he's going to read it. Yeah, that would be fucking terrible. Do you remember on the picket line? He sounded like a strikebreaker spy. I know. That's what I'm saying. I mean, read as it. Labor, he's uh, going to read it. Not as labor, as trans- it wasn't the best deal. Oh, actually, an interesting question. Uh, oh, so he, family father, man. Like, I'm, I'm kind of jumping over things that I wanted to get to in a timely manner because I just got, oh. you know, I, I, I'm a fan of this man. But like, as far as I've seen, he seems like a really, really solid choice. Uh, this is our best ticket. Bashar, absolutely. Okay, another tweet. Wait, back to this article. Uh, a black and Indian woman on the ticket. We got we this article. Little goddamn tweet and message. Oh, another article. He's got a focus group happening in the back of his fucking mind at all times. He's a McKinsey guy. He's uh. <laughs> Does um, he literally? Yeah. He actually just reads headlines? Is this the actual meme? It looks like he, he he reads a tweet about an article, then he opens the article, and then he reads the headline, and then he just goes to the next thing. Does he actually read any of these? He's got a focus group happening in the back of his fucking mind at all times. He's a McKinsey guy. Anyway, um, but yeah, he's pro union. Okay, he's another art work. He's uh, he's he's uh, <laughs> eviscerated uh, charter schools in his media literacy. By the way, state. He's, he's, he's can he even out. read? About their campaign was just me. Okay. Shapiro, fuck no. More of a YouTube video was, thing. There's gotta be limits. Okay. History, Another like YouTube video. I know he's like thinking in his mind. Uh, Vance, his YouTube video, ball. YouTube video. Oh, tweet. Two things. There's two who do that last time around. The camera. Uh, uh, JD Vance is doing that too, by the way. He is uh, on the ballot. Singular. Twitter force. video, Twitter uh, video, video uh, tweet. Vice President Kamala Harris. Do you tweet. think personally? Oh, hold on. Oh, no, wait. Is this the thing that triggered him? Yeah, this is the thing that triggered him. He didn't read this I article. Martin Luther King and, and uh, Bobby Kennedy. YouTube video, sure. YouTube Just video. Talk. So I actually made a bet. Uh, Hutch, a ago, probably shitting on Hutch. Really nice. I mean, a hundred dollar bet that they would not replace Biden. And I'm hoping, I think it's like a 50, 50. Dude, why the fuck would you get your fucking politics from a goddamn Call of Duty player, dude? Like, I'm sorry. You're like, this is what you deserve. If you're like, oh, I wonder what like an older COD player has to say about uh, this particular thing. Like you deserve to. Hutch has read more news articles cover to cover in one month than Hassan has in two years. I bet my life on that. Easy. Easy. It'd be wrong all the time. Like, that's just what's going to happen. The chance that he forgets. MSNBC. And at a time, he's hitting. YouTube oh, yeah, so video, cool. YouTube video, YouTube video. Tweet, Anyone. tweet. Uh, literally avoid the name associated. Tweet. Thank you, guys. Uh, Thank you. Another video. Thing in my power. As YouTube Man, video. Tweet, tweet. With insane. With YouTube video. Not gonna do it. Tweet. Voter. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. This There's is an article. In support of Benjamin. Is he going to read this Voters. one? Used to reckon with this reality. Oh my God! Hold on, he might be reading this article. Obama was another economy, and Barack Obama just by millions of people who actually been in with insane with the. Okay, buggers. That's true. It was one of the best. Obama was another guy, by the way. Okay, here we go. For Kamala being better in Gaza, I think, like I said, it's a it's a bit of a tricky situation. She's dead. on issues where Joe Biden is weak or was weak. Scale actually scrutinized the record. Harris better the Gaza war, even if she expressed moral and tactical disagreement, while she does not have half a century of overwhelming support for Israel's brutality and militarism like Biden. Ugh, Jeremy Scahill is one of the disgusting authors that was involved in denying the, uh, any of the sexual assaults, or the, at least any of the reporting on the sexual assaults um, on The Intercept. He's the guy that started with um, Ryan Grimm and somebody else that dropped news or whatever, drop site news. And she does have a record for, of hardline support for Israel. So, like, what I'm looking for in this situation is, is she going to be, Obama was another guy, by the way, who was... Critical of Israel, and then on his way out, okay. he gave thirty-eight. Will he at least Israel. read That's this article? Netanyahu called him boy, basically, over and over again. Netanyahu famously said Barack Obama. Netanyahu famously said Barack Obama was a young boy who didn't know anything about the Middle East. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Dude. Banning Do you mean Joe Biden is a secret Jew? Okay. <sighs> anyway. Um. Okay. Um. So I think she will pick up a lot. She will pick up. There's like eight. I didn't just read like. Oh, <sighs> here we go. Let's. Now is Joe Biden announcing he would not seek re-election. The Democratic Party's power elite began consolidating the support for Vice President Kamala Harris. I think Michigan, in the critical state of Michigan alone, where a devastating poll from the Detroit Free Press on Sunday morning showed Biden down seven percentage points to Trump across the state, where over one, where there were over one hundred thousand uncommitted primary voters. You will not, you will not win Michigan if you don't fix the message on Gaza. And not, not only the. You kind of skipped the middle sentence there, but that was okay. It still counts. I'll, I'll give him. I'll give him the first paragraph. He skipped like half of it, but that's okay. Fix we the message him. on Gaza. But you also have to show. You have to demonstrate that okay. there is now a change in attitude. That's that okay. people can believe in, okay? Like, that's it's over. It's Jover at that point. It's actually fucking super Jover. Is this an article from someone he agrees with? Yes, this is a disgusting uh, misinformation propagandist. Uh, this guy, I, he might even, I think this guy's actually on my blacklist for, like, you sh just shouldn't even waste your time reading. Unless you want to just do research to, like, debunk bad talking points. Um, blacklist 
media blacklist. Yes, Jeremy Skyhill. He's on here. He is on here. He's a dog shit journalist. Okay, but don't worry. Let's see. But it, listen, hey, if you, at least he reads something, I'll, at least, even if it's a bad article, at least he reads it. Maybe. Let's see. Keep trying to stress, but people refuse to reckon with this reality for some reason. And they think like, oh, if you don't vote for Kamala Harris, then, you know, good luck getting deported is not going to be the winning message that you think it is. Okay. Notably, the mayor of Dearborn, Michigan, of Allah, Hamoud, okay. come out in favor of Harris and said he posted them to have an opportunity to be bold this convention. To nominate a candidate who can usher historic policy domestically and abandon the genocidal course charting Gaza and beyond. America needs a candidate who can inspire voters to come out of the, come out of the ballot box this November. Okay. Nice. 75% of those uncommitted voters will fold when faced with Trump in a real election. Primary is meh. <laughs> it appears to me that I have more Democrats. Okay. This attitude is exactly how Trump won. Oh my God. He's going to read this. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. Okay. I believe Party him. has like convinced. Nah, they'll just get scared and they'll vote. He's going like, to do it. It's very stupid. I don't know how the Democratic Party and the media apparatus that accompanies the Democratic Party has He's like gonna convinced do it. normal people, not people who's corrupt. Okay, come on. Let's go. Next paragraph. Now, it's what? not just Gaza. Okay. She was the, but if she continues from uh, top of the ticket Democrats and from the establishment Democrats in the party on, we will be the border, we will be the border control party. That is a massive, president was scheduled to attend an event for his No. Okay. Oh, Harris plans private meeting with Netanyahu. She skips. That is a massive failure. Did okay. he? Oh, Harris plans private meeting with Netanyahu. She skips congressional address. The vice president was scheduled to attend an event for his Beta sorority in Indianapolis before the Israeli prime minister's address date was sent. No. Okay. He's going to read this article. It's this article is like three paragraphs. He'll read this one. He'll read this one. She's not going to be. Uh, she's not going to be there for BB's joint address to Congress. But we'll conduct a separate bilateral meeting with the Israeli prime minister this week at the White House. Okay. Oh my God. We're going to get this one. We're going to do this. One. To attend an event uh, for a sorority that doesn't really mean much. Like that's something you can totally say you're not going to if you thought it was important enough for you to put yourself out there as someone who's in that's fine we count it we give we count those well, speaking to congress we count those just want every come on one more American there's like there's like one conspiracy. more paragraph in two sentences you can do it come on come on come on there's, that's got to be the reason because he's on the perfect line come on one more one more one more icj decision coming down declaring israel to be an apartheid state okay something that pretty much every ngo every human rights organization agrees on including israeli human rights organizations um come on come on come on you got it you got it it's just it's just completely completely ridiculous you have upcoming ICC arrest warrants. The ICJ just said, there, great. You can do it. In a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Netanyahu. So, oh, okay. We'll look at John Oliver in a little bit. So. He's an actual headline reader. He, he's like, he, this is the cancer killing my country, unironically. He reads the headline and that's his, that's his presentation. Wait, well, hold on. There's still three more hours left of the stream. Hold on. Whoa, wait, he's coming back. I have confidence. Oh, he's coming back in her one-on-one -on -one meeting. Okay, there's like, oh my God, he's so close. Hold on, we can do this. In Kamala Harris. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. As far as like changing the course, changing the trajectory of like- Let's go, come on, let's go. In her one-on-one -on -one meeting with Netanyahu. Years. Absolutely is not the person. That Israel security and right to defense. <gasps> oh, oh, we shall see. Hold on, hold on. In her one-on-one -on -one meeting with Netanyahu, Harris plans to reiterate her commitment to Israel's security and right to defend itself, but will also convey her view that it is time for the war to end in a way where Israel is secure, all hostages are released, the suffering of Palestinian civilians in Gaza ends, and the Palestinian people can enjoy their right to dignity, freedom, and self-determination. Harris also plans to discuss the ongoing negotiations on a ceasefire deal. Okay. There's some daylight between Harris and Biden on the issue of Israel and Gaza for months. Since the beginning of the war, Harris has been telling colleagues in the administration, including Biden, that she wants the White House to show more concern publicly for the humanitarian damage in Gaza. This okay. at least shows that she has the right political instincts, even if she does not morally care about oh the apartheid and genocide. He's going to do this. Which is, he will get through this article. Three more paragraphs, and then I think that's it. You know, better than Joe, I guess. Come on. You can do it. You can do not it. saying much. He's on the run. He's on the run. To state solution. This is close to the vice president's office. Says she believes the United States should be tougher on Netanyahu. He's not he even skipping sentences on this one. A long-term peace deal and a two state solution. Okay. Senate president pro Patty Murray, who would have been next in line to president over Netanyahu's joint address, declined to do so according to his spokesperson. The person also called political senator won't be attending the address at all. A growing number of congressional Democrats are boycotting the event. Every Democrat should boycott this event. Okay. Too it much. is ridiculous. This is the end. Senator Ben Cardin will instead be the senator behind Netanyahu on Wednesday, according to a person familiar with the plans who was granted anonymity to discuss private <sighs> conversations. Meanwhile, Capitol Police officials have warned lawmakers and staff of the protesters in the days leading up to the visit from Netanyahu. There will be increased security around the Capitol complex, especially Wednesday when Netanyahu is scheduled to speak. Oh, good job. Thank God. My streamer. My new streamer. Oh. Hell yes. Oh. Are you condearing a lie? What? Dude, come on. Is this the top of the hour average debate? Is that what we're doing now? You didn't even spell it correctly. No. Well, I'm not lying. At the top of the hour, there is a three-minute average regardless. It will also, once again, look really fucking bad. Oh, by the month, user on your favorite. Harris supported Biden's policies, even if <gasps> Jonathan Liz for Harvard's. Oh, we went back to this article. And to even expend political capital. And if she doesn't do that, I suspect she will lose Michigan, regardless. And she won't be able to capture enough of the youth vote that the okay. Democrats desperately need. Okay, hold on. He's about to read this paragraph. Jonathan Liz for Harvard says those around Indiana who the meeting with Biden may not take. Okay. He's going to do it. Hold on. Anyway, Harris supported Biden's policies, even if she raised tactical objections or expressed moral and used the horrifying death toll. While Harris is not Biden and does not have half a century of overwhelming support for Israel's brutality and militarism, dealing with her positions, she does have her own record of hardline support for Israel, both as senator and as vice president. Okay. 
Soon after being elected in the Senate in 2016, Harris earned the reputation as an ardent defender of Israel. This is a big paragraph he's about to read. I hope he breaks it up with some commentary. Spoke two years in a row at APAC. Conference's co sponsored legislation aimed at undermining the United Nations resolution condemning Israel's illegal annexation of Palestinian land. One of her first international trips as a senator was to Israel, where she met Benjamin Netanyahu in 2017. My support to the United States commitment to provide Israel with 38 billion in military oh assistance in the next decade. Harris told the APAC conference that year. That was Obama. That was Obama's wonderful gift on his way out. I believe the bonds between the United States and Israel are unbreakable, and we can never let anyone drive a wedge between us. As long as I'm a United States senator, I will do everything in my power to ensure broad and bipartisan support for Israel's security and right to self defense. Damn, that was a huge paragraph. Harris has compared building support for Israel and the coalition's forged during the U.S. civil rights movement and embraced President Donald Trump's Abraham Accords, just like the rest of the fucking dumbasses in the Democratic Party. Achievement in 2016. Okay. Okay. Especially crimes against Palestinians, nice. weapons to Israel, is one of those like. Okay. About oh, he might read one more. About Bernie Sanders as well. Wait. I have to fix that. If she wants to. He has read two. We give him that. Anyway. Wait, Israel didn't like the nuclear deal? Of course. More than it did. I don't know what will have confidence that she is. Don't know about those. Those tweet, tweet, Another tweet, tweet. YouTube Democrat video. Governor, and now we'll be locked and insane if you video, care about it. Video, tweet. YouTube video. YouTube video. YouTube video. YouTube video. Policy. <sighs> video, video. Oh, quit. And to turn dumb as to go out of your way. Video. Then chat. TikTok. Yes, video. 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 We give him that. We give him that. Okay. Okay. Back to our artistic legal quibbles. Okay. Arizona. What I want to know is how does Arizona prescribe choice of the electors it seems like they really don't list any other requirements all they say is on the first tuesday after the first monday in november 1956 and quadrillennially thereafter there shall be elected a number of presidential electors equal to the number of united states senators and representatives in congress from this state after the Secretary of State issues the statewide canvas containing the results of a presidential election, the presidential electors of this state shall cast their electoral college votes for the candidate for president and the candidate for vice president who jointly received the highest number of votes in the state as prescribed in the canvas. Okay, I would argue, because fuck these guys. Um, unless there's some other provision that I'm not aware of, um, Let's see, what is this? Title 16. No, it's not Title 16, I'm sorry. Or no, I think it is, that's 16 dash. This is all for the election stuff. I don't think there's anything else. Wait, voting procedure for ill electors or electors with disabilities, don't care about this. Manner of voting, assistance for certain electors. This is about people actually voting in the election. Okay, this is just for actual. These aren't like the elector electors. Corruption of electors. for paying for votes. Okay. Registration of electors. I still think this is just for normal like citizens, right? A county record, the county recorder just to the piece, registration for any qualified person requesting registration information. Information regarding the qualification necessary to register to vote. Okay. Electoral college votes. Okay, yeah. So it is this. Okay. Arizona state law. Now you're the most informed you've ever been. How do you feel about people wanting to do away with the electoral college? Such people claiming because the popular vote can be disregarded in some cases means we aren't living in a democracy. But democracy means a whole bunch of different things. There's not one thing of like a democracy. Also, um, I'm fine with the electoral college. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm not, I don't have a huge deal with it. If you, wanted, if you really wanted to change it, I think it would be pretty, you'd have to, I, I think you would have to amend the Constitution, I think. 
you would have to, I'm pretty sure you have to amend the Constitution. Well, yeah. No. Really, I think you would. I think you would. Because I was thinking that, like, you could just have states all go by popular vote and then make enough electors to, like, rep. But I, I, think, you'd, I think you'd have to amend the Constitution to do it. Or, yeah, that's true, too. You could get every single state to just pledge their electors to whoever wins the popular vote. You could do that. I'm new to you and really like your content. Can you explain why you don't like Vosh and Hassan? Is there some backstory I'm not aware of? Oh, there's lots of backstory. They both lie about me horrendously. Um, I don't like Hassan because Hassan doesn't do good research. He's not, um, he just doesn't provide good information. He lies constantly. Um, I don't like Vosh because Vosh also lies and he's smart enough to know that he shouldn't be doing it. Um, Vosh has more potential than Hassan does when it comes to media delivery, but Vosh is both lazy and a bad faith actor. So he just does whatever, um, yeah, I don't know. I like Vosh a little bit more than Hassan, but. Both of them, I think, are pretty gross. But Hassan is, like, offensively stupid. And Vosh is just, like, he chooses to be a dipshit. Real quick. You yeah. there? What's up? Just real quick. I'm glad that you're going over the Electoral College things. Because I think it's one additional argument against this anti-democracy thing about Biden's withdrawal. I know you don't care about it anyway. Okay. Um, and it also a way to distinguish people who say, well, what about pushes to have the electors be... Um, faithless electors. When you're voting for president in a general election, you're not actually voting for president, right? You're voting for a slate of electors chosen mm -hmm. by you know, party insiders. Same thing with the nominations. You're not actually voting for Joe Biden in the nomination contest. You're voting for delegates, delegates who are loyal, handpicked by Joe Biden. And so there's nothing procedurally or officially wrong with advocating for electors to vote their conscience. That is the, the purpose, the intended um, purpose of, of having electors is to have one last check on the votes of the people. At least, you know, that was the one of the rationales for putting it in the first place. The people who do the real vote are the electors. In the context of the nominations, the real vote happens at the convention. And so everyone who voted for Joe Biden, your vote still counts. You voted for a slate of delegates, and those delegates are loyal to Joe Biden. And I don't disagree with what actually, you're saying in terms of like process. It's just most people aren't aware yeah. of this, so they don't feel that way, right? Even if it is true. I understand right? that, but yeah. th th there has to be a way for you to distinguish in your mind the alternate, and, and I'm, there's other ways, of course, but mm -hmm. the alternate slates of electors versus people who are saying, you know, Trump's electors should just vote for Clinton or something like that, because um, they're materially different. Well, hold on, wait. Well, wait, 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 hold on. Wait, wait, hold, Advocating wait, wait, wait. for wait, no, no, wait, wait, hold on, wait. I know what I'm saying. I'm just saying, yeah. to be very, very, very clear, um, the when we talk about the delegates that the parties have, those are yeah. private, not state law. Those are their own thing. Right. Those are de those are way different than the electors that a state appoints. Those are going to be confined by the state laws and the state constitutions. And, no, and, I get it, yeah. but I'm I'm mm -hmm. comparing the ideas where they're both indirect elections, and the real election are for the slates of delegates for oh. purposes of the nomination, and for the slates of electors for purposes of the general election. And so, to the extent that you're saying that like the votes don't matter. Well, no, I mean, like if you had a bunch of delegates that were sworn to Bernie Sanders versus a bunch of delegates sworn to, to Joe Biden, what you would be seeing now in terms of who the delegates are coalescing around would be very, very different. And so all of your votes, votes absolutely did matter. Um, it just happened that the, the candidate withdrew and you could see, um, a basis for the system in the nomination process in the actual general election process. One of the reasons why we would have an electoral college system is, in case like the candidate died, right? Mm -hmm. um, before the, the actual electoral vote. And so I, I, that level of formalism I think is, is relevant because also it tells you, I think what grounds are on the table and what are not. Trying to convince electors that for whatever reason change circumstance happened, you can't vote for Joe Biden. You should vote for Trump in 2020. I don't think we would have had, we wouldn't have called that like uh, an attempted coup, right? Would we? Would you? For what thing? Trying to get, if, if the, all the Trump people did was trying to convince the electors to vote for Trump as opposed to Biden. To vote for Trump? Uh, to, wait, which electors? 
the 2020 electors, to the Joe Biden electors, trying to convince the, the DNC the delegates slated, or the, the state electors? The state electors in 2020 to, to try to convince them prior oh. to the Electoral College vote. If um, all you were trying to do is convince them to vote for, for Trump. We're getting like it's, it's we're getting like very, very procedural here, but it would it would it would vary based on the state laws. Like, how are they supposed to vote? Like, if you're encouraging yeah, them to do something that like, there, was no, there was no state law that re that required them to do so. Assuming, assuming there was no state law that required them to do so. Oof, I don't know, chief. That's like a. I, you would I, have a problem. I, I would have a problem with with that action as a would you call that like a coup or a, anything that the, pr the problem is it just it runs so contrary to our current understanding. It would be like you. It would be like me asking you, do you think that the president should be able to unilaterally to decide to stay in office for four more years? But 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 let's yeah, assume that like the Constitution has written there's a button under his desk and he can push it to stay in office for four more years. Do you think he can do that? I'd be like, well, I guess like, yeah, but <laughs> that's so contrary to the system, you know, that like and then, and then instead of having elections, we just have lobbyists that are all going to like electors, like telling them who to vote for. I don't think. Yeah. But I mean, to, but I mean, to the credit of that, um, the electors initially, did they move completely independently or did they only listen to like landowner? I thought that the electors voted differently initially. I don't think that we, we had popular votes initially in states to determine who the electors voted for. Right. The states allocate their electors and there was not a, a you know, popular vote mm -hmm. wasn't ubiquitous across the initial um, 13 states yeah. under the Constitution. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I don't know. I, I think that the, right now the expectation is that your electors are going to be faithful. I think I would have yeah. a problem with a bunch of faithless electors or electors being convinced to. You would have a problem, but, but it wouldn't be the problem you have with the alternate slates of electors, right? It wouldn't be that problem. It would be like, oh, we need to change the Constitution. To never let this happen. Oh, would be like, well, oh, this is a dumb not, probably not. To be ultra super, to thread the needle a lot, I'm, I'm, I don't even necessarily think that the alternate slates of electors are necessarily bad, but it's how they went about it and what they were doing was clearly part of a broader conspiracy. Like, let's say, for instance, so we could easily imagine this. Donald Trump's campaign goes to these seven states and he says, listen, because this is kind of, this is how they wanted to present it, okay? We are still challenging these election results, okay? We understand that on the 14th, all the electors voted, but we don't certify until the 6th. We are gonna request in these seven states, we should be allowed to make an alternate slate of electors in all seven states, and then just in case we find voter fraud between now and January 6th, we don't wanna be screwed because we don't have another slate of electors, now we're totally fucked. So I think it's fair for us to request, can we just do alternate slates of electors? And you know what? They might have even been able to get away with that because so many Republicans were willing to go along with every cockamamie crazy fucking plan they had, but they didn't do that. They were quiet about it, they kept it under wraps, and they were gonna to try to use it in coordination with the insurrection on the 6th to pressure Pence in order to accept these alternate slates of electors without there being voter fraud. That's my issue. So on its own, I don't think that having alternate electorate slates are bad, kind of like Hawaii, that would be more comparable to Hawaii, as long as you're like talking to everybody about it, but they clearly were using this as part of a broader conspiracy. So you're saying alternate slates of electors in your mind for the purpose of litigation strategy is different than alternate slates of electors for the purpose of Mike Pence unilateral bullshit. Which yeah, been for sure. Because like so the best faith he... reading of this would be, because let's say for instance, because I don't even know this is true, but this is what Chesbro is saying. I read all the text in some deposition or whatever, but like Chesbro is saying that like, let's say that on, let's say that on December 20th, let's say like six states all uncover massive voter fraud, right? You're like, holy shit, like this is actually fucked. Yeah. And then let's say January 6th rolls around and it's time to certify the vote. Well, let's say that we know that there's a ton of voter fraud. It's like, okay, well, fuck, maybe these states would have flipped their electorate votes or they would have done something different, but you've already transmitted your electoral votes as per the constitution. Well, fuck, now you're you're fucked, right? Well, if you send in alternate slates, like Hawaii did in 1960, you could have them just say, well, we're going to authorize the other slate, uh, the other slates. And then in that case, I'm like, yeah, okay. I don't think I have any problem with that at all, right? Everything's in the open, everything's in the open up. Like, yeah, that makes sense. But that wasn't what they did. <laughs> but there has to be a cutoff at some point, right? Like you would agree, like after the absolute limit, like you can't have these challenges after the new, the new president is inaugurated. Is that fair? Do you agree with that? The, I would say they would only go up to January 6th, if that, right? Okay, but like, right. why, why did, why do we need to have a cutoff? Why is it not okay to have a cutoff before January six in terms of when these challenges are stale? Why do we need to have that like a time lag period? If if anyone is gonna assess these situations, shouldn't it be Congress in these like kind of one off situations? Well, if where... you the question would just be like, how much time do you need to find the fraud? Well, the election was what November fourth. 
Um, the w- w- what do you mean? The like the, the, the general right. election? I think it's the number third, right? Like maybe it might be so November third. So maybe by like December fourteenth, maybe you feel like you don't. That's when the electors vote. Maybe you feel like in a month you don't have time, and maybe in two more weeks you could find something. Maybe, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's okay to have cutoff periods for when all your challenges have to be submitted by. And if if there's like a problem afterwards, you know, at a certain point your your claim is going to be stale for sure. Because at a certain point there needs to be an inauguration, so we can't keep litigating this forever. That's one of the reasons why I think the challenges on procedural grounds are so offensive. The people who are trying to invalidate Act 77, for instance, um, after the election, when they knew in advance that this was going to be the way that it was going to be run, yeah. why didn't we see ch- challenges trying to invalidate it uh, prior to that? Which I um, think some of the judges said too, right? Like you can't be challenging procedure when you've lost. That's insane. Like it, it, kind it of a waiver. It calls into like questions, it, yeah, your entire, yeah, the motivation, yeah. Because I think it would have been really, like imagine that, a Pennsylvania Supreme Court found actually Act 77 is unconstitutional afterwards. Okay. The remedy wouldn't be like, like, or, or even I'll say, let's say that they found that Act 77 was unconstitutional before the election, the Electoral College meets. Okay. December 14th, yeah. What do you think the remedy should be? Invalidate the whole election? Um, Act 77 had to do with them extending slightly the, yeah. when they would. Um... Or, or no, no, no. Who... So we're extending mail-in voting to everybody. Yeah. And there was like a massive increase in mail-in voting in Pennsylvania okay. versus in other years. So like some crazy amount of percentage increase were mail-in ballots. And yeah. the Pennsylvania Supreme Court says, yeah, that's all unconstitutional. You're not allowed to do that. You're supposed to limit it to people who fit into these categories. The remedy would have to be uh, redoing the election. You think so? Right. Is that what you would rule? Absolutely. It can't be casting those ballots out because you'd be disenfranchising uh, like clearly a biased side or, or like um, it would heavily weight against one side, right? And if you're going to t- to cast aside that many ballots, you're going to have to do a re-election, right? Okay. Well, what if, what if there's like a, a more minor issue, which is like they let in, they let people do mail-in voting with like blue pens and black pens, but it's actually unconstitutional to have a, to use a blue pen for mail-in ballots. But like, let's say 50% of mail-in um votes were done with blue pens in that case there's a massive constitutional violation you're only allowed to use black pens would you invalidate the election based on that um i mean if there if there is a constitutional violation and you're having um i i think arguably you would wouldn't you i don't think that every constitutional violation requires when people in good faith every procedural one like, I guess yeah, this yeah. would be the problem. Let's say that you have, um, let's say that you had people that showed up. Let's say that a ton of people, a thousand people, you know, start tweeting or screaming anger. I showed up and all I had was a, was a blue pen that blue day pen. and I couldn't fill out my thing. And now you guys are changing the procedure without notice. And now fuck me. I have like, these are my procedural rights. These are why procedural rights can be yeah. challenged without having to, to show an injury, right? To, to say that you've, you know, something isn't right here. But yeah, I mean, like, but I mean, like, obviously, these would be like historically massively huge cases. So I'm sure there might be some things that would depend. I, I don't know, like what the case law is here. The notion that there's like there are some constitutional violations that would be so severe that everyone would agree that the, the election should be redone. For example, if you there was widespread reports that like a certain racial minority just wasn't being allowed to vote. Sure. I think you would agree instantly, like nullify the results of the election and do a new one. Fair. Probably. Yeah, almost certainly. Yeah. But. And then you have cases where, like, okay, this is more, yeah, it was unconstitutional under the state constitution, so says the state Supreme Court, Mm -hmm. to use the blue pens or to have the ballot drop-offs in these various locations, but we're not going to invalidate a whole election for it. And then you kind of have these kind of middle ground areas, I don't know if you want to call it a zone of twilight, where, like, okay, a major substantive method of voting, that is mail-in voting, extended to the entire population, Mm -hmm. supposing that were invalidated, well, what do you do? You have a bunch of people who are relying in good faith on the legislature to pass a law. Remember, Act 77 was a Pennsylvania state law. Yeah. They're relying on their legislators to pass constitutional laws, and it just so happens that it's ruled unconstitutional. In that situation where it is you know, an area of major substance, but it could affect the outcome of the election, and it's now been ruled unconstitutional, I, I think that you should have a way to think about, maybe not for the future conversations, but just putting it out there that um, you know, what, what constitutional, what legal issues would you find severe enough to, um, to, undo you know what I would say? You know what I would say? I would say that we would look at the, uh, we would look at the regulation for how they made it 
so that you could have the different colored pens. And even、mm-hmm. if it was against the law, we would see if the、uh, statutory construction was permissible. And as long as it was permissible, we'd say, <laughs> you know what? That can stand. I think that's totally A OK. <laughs> yeah, we'd say that's A OK.、Yeah. Um, I don't know. What do you think? What is the answer to that?、Uh, Esports Batman came in earlier and talked through like some.、Um, Like the concept I, I, of a.、Uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Or, or like procedural due process and everything, yeah. So, this is my thought process. I、mm-hmm. think that once a state grants a vote for president, n- they don't have to, but once they do,、mm-hmm. it becomes a fundamental right. And if once it becomes a fundamental right, I think our proper frame of analysis is strict scrutiny, just like any other right, right?、Mm-hmm. You cannot、uh, burden a fundamental right, such as voting. If, unless the regulation is narrowly tailored、mm-hmm. and、uh, for a compelling state interest. And so I think that any kind of, I think, and that, I think that is a federal constitutional protection. So, in my opinion, in order to invalidate and thereby deprive people of their fundamental right to vote, you're going to have to show that the procedural rule. Well, wait, hold on. Which,、yeah. which, which side of the equation is the strict scrutiny applying to here? Is it going to be the, the people? Government- The people who were, yeah, but it, it, was it the people that were allowed to vote or the people that weren't allowed to vote? Like, who, is, who are we thinking it, of here? It, oh, sorry. This would potentially apply to the remedy. So,、yeah. the government, even judicial acts can be measured for com,、um, sort of comporting with the Constitution.、Mm-hmm. The judicial act of nullifying the whole election would undoubtedly infringe on even lawfully cast ballots. Fair? It seems to be the case, yeah. Right. But, that, so but then the that, question would be like, wouldn't there be a greater injury on the party that. Um, isn't even allowed to cast a vote then? Like, because the people who are getting their vote invalidated could cast another ballot, right? The people who are getting their vote invalid, no, everyone's vote. Be, we're talking about nullifying if the remedy were nullifying the entire election as、sure. opposed to just nullifying the specific things. Yeah. If you were just nullifying the specific things, I think there you have an equal protection problem. And the equal protection problem is well, both, you know, with respect to fundamental rights, if you、mm-hmm. treat, if you make categories of people、um, and treat them differently, Based on a fundamental right, that can also be a trigger for strict scrutiny. And so I think there's two ways of conceptualizing it.、Um, if the remedy is to just nullify the whole election, I think you have a,、sure. a substantive problem there, a fundamental rights problem. And what, I do think just, that it's, although I think, I don't know in terms of legal analysis, like when you talk about the level of scrutiny that you want to apply, we're generally looking to see if there's like a violation of equal protections, right? Either, right? It can either be triggered. With equal protection, that's the classic、yeah. the equal protection stuff. But also in the context of fundamental rights, if you think、sure. about like. But when, we're, but when we're talking about this particular issue here, we're talking about whether or not a given law or regulation is violative of a constitution. Does a scrutiny argument apply here? Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Because this,、uh, in Bush v. Gore,、mm-hmm. the court described that once you, the, a state decides to have a presidential election, that right becomes fundamental, even though they don't have to have it. In the first instance, right? You don't even have When to. When you have say a, the, a right becomes fundamental, does that mean as、yeah. though it were constitutionally granted? Is that what you mean there? Like, right. Okay, okay. Exactly.、Oh, even、okay. though that there's no constitutional right to vote for president, and there isn't、mm-hmm. because it's all allocated to the states,、um, the court has described that once you decide to have a, an election for president, then and only then does it become fundamental. Gotcha.、And、I think、okay. that's a proper analysis, yeah.、Uh, Enter, now,、okay. this is a little bit weird because then you'd ask the question, like, well, what if. A state decides to just pass a law that nullifies their election and just give all their electors to, the, to Donald Trump.、Mm-hmm. How would you analyze that? Would you take into consideration the state's like plenary authority to assign their electors first? Or would you say that like once they've granted that right to vote, that should be respected? That's another issue that, you know. Sure. Well, I, I mean, for that, all of the,、um, the becomes a fundamental right thing, it gets us over the hump of how can we ever have, because theoretically, a regulation or law should never. Uh, contravene a、uh, constitution, right? A state constitution should always be supreme over. There is no way to overcome that.、Um, so the fundamental right allows you to overcome that. Well, now actually we're doing a different type of constitutional analysis. But if you are doing a,、um, if you're trying to change the way that votes are assigned or anything like that, you would still have to get the,、um, you'd have to hit the constitutional question, right? Like they, if they change the constitution, they theoretically could do it. But if they did something、right. that contravenes their constitution, they can't do it unless you find a way, I guess, to implicate those rights in a way that becomes、Better. fundamental. Yeah. Just some thoughts, bro. Okay. If you're,、uh, what's up? Oh, I just, I love you. I thought you were going to leave. What's up? I'm about to leave you, but I just wanted to say I really recommend that you watch it like that 10 minutes with me and、uh, with Andrew Wilson moderating that discussion about insurrection. 
okay. you're going to have a debate on that because I think that just a, it's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. I love you, baby. All right, man. Much love. God, I got such a fucking nerd. Ultimately, there were seven different states whom were selected to send all slates of electorates out to or from those states and the uh, accompanying state laws that would dictate, or that do dictate, that dictate uh, slates of electors are legally supposed to be chosen. True or false, Eastman's position was that Pence was sole authority for deciding ballot validity during certification. He was hoping either one, VP chooses false electors and slates they needed, or two, VP becomes confused and defers the House. Uh, true. That is what I believe Eastman was doing, at least by the second memo, yeah. I'll just include the Eastman memos in here, though. Okay, Georgia, 16 electors. Do you think the Supreme Court should be changed? If so, how do you think it can be improved? I think every president should get two uh, Supreme Court justice picks. I think that would be better than what we do now, where it's like a lottery. <laughs> Georgia, state law, states. Okay. Georgia code, blah, 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 here requires that the electors assemble at the seat of government of this state at 12 o'clock noon on December 14th. But what does seat of government mean? See here, at minimum, they must meet somewhere in Atlanta. Must they meet in the Capitol building? And then here is another part of the code. It supplies a mechanism for replacing one or more of the 16 electors if someone dies or fails to attend. In that event, the electors in attendance shall proceed to choose by voice, vote a person of the same political party to fill the vacancy. However, here is, there's a wrinkle. Unlike in other states where that choice is automatically effective, in Georgia, a choice must be ratified. What would then be the term limits of the justice? 12 years? I don't know, whatever it would ordinarily be. Okay, Georgia, Georgia state code 21 to 11. What if three justices die in one president's term? Then the next guy gets more. We could figure it out. I don't understand why you ask like, questions that you obviously you would just figure out an exception to. <laughs> That's called packing the courts? No, it's not called packing the courts. Wait, what? Shouldn't... Georgia should have their law online. Hello? Oh, here we go. Thank you. Okay, 21 to 11. Wait, the fuck is this? Is it really this far off? Code Anne. What the fuck does the Anne mean? Christ. Do I have to go to a whole different department? Department 20, 21 to 11. No. Okay, but it's rule 183 maybe? Department 183 for elections? Okay. Georgia Municipal Election Code. 21 to 11. No? I don't know if I'm in the right thing. Rules and regulations. 
state of Georgia, electoral college. Tony, our donut operator should talk to you for your takeout, but his entire channel is him making fun of people who get killed by cops. Bayzad. Twenty one two four ninety seven. This is not Okay. Title twenty one. Georgia code title twenty one. Georgia code title twenty one. What is this AIDS? Oh, is it like just a bill? They don't have it listed on their site? Shouldn't this be? GA code and I don't know what that and means. Maybe it means it was a bill or something. Qualifications, disqualifications for holding state or county. Holy. Oh my God. Seat of government. Oh, we found it. Okay, 21, 2, 11. 21, 2. Wait, oh my God, it's skipping around. Wait, presidential elector. Okay, wait, I think that was it. Okay. Presidential elector. Yeah, it's this. Okay, qualifications. Neither the state constitution nor laws establish any specific qualifications for this office. Since presidential electors are state officials, the general qualifications established for state officials apply as follows. Must be a citizen of the state. Must be at least 21 years of age. Um, why does January 6th matter when it comes to the Eastman memo? Um, what would the counterfactual be if January 6th riot didn't happen? Could they still implement the Eastman plan? They could, but January 6th, the ellipsis speech and everything, is what turns it from a coup into an insurrection. I think Donald Trump wanted there to be violence on that day to pressure through violence um, the uh, Congress to to pick his fake electors. I think that was part of the that was part of the plan. It was all like working concurrently with each other. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature there may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled to in the Congress. In the, um, wait, actually, I'm so sorry. Hold on, wait, real quick. Oh, this is true, too. I should just have this. False Arizona slate of electors. Were not elected and did not cast their ballots. Voted by the state. Okay. That's good to have. 
Okay, Georgia. What? Oh. Don't care, don't care, don't care. Okay. Trump wasn't intentionally pushing for violence on J6. Does that alter your opinion at all? I mean, it changes it from an insurrection to a coup. <laughs> Wait, what is this? State laws regarding electors. Oh, this is just what I'm looking up on my own, but okay. And this is for November 2016. Don't care. Cringe. Okay. <clears throat> Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number. Okay. Each state shall appoint. So you're pretty much there. They all follow the state laws, so they are legit. What? No. In Arizona, they did not follow the state laws. The electors were not elected, and they did not cast their ballots in concordance with the popular vote reported by the state. So for Arizona, that's not true. My guess is going to be for all of these, it's not true, but I'm just, I just want to read the statutes myself just to see. Oh, this is incorporated or listed from the Constitution, Article 2 stuff. The names of the nominees of political parties nominated in a primary, the names of the nominees of political parties for the office of presidential elector, and the names of candidates nominated in a nonpartisan primary shall be placed on the election ballot without filling the notice of candidacy otherwise required by this code section. Eligibility of writing candidates, don't care about this. of nominees of political parties nominated in a primary and the names of nominees of political presidential elector cool. and the names of not wait you don't in Georgia they don't vote for their electors do they or nominated in a non-person person be placed on the election ballot without their filing the notice of candidacy otherwise required by this code section or maybe they're just automatically elected with the president I guess <laughs> eligibility right in candidate um Is if any dies.
Wait, where is this assemble at the seat of government quote? Assemble at... Oh, fuck. Where does he pull this from? Seat of... Oh. I'm so fucking confused why I can't find this. Is Georgia's like shit not listed online? Like what is, okay, OCGA. Official code of Georgia, annotated. Okay, compendium of all the laws. Is, is, is Georgia's, like, code not online? It's not listed online? Their fucking laws aren't online? Or am I fucking retarded? Can I just not find it? Twenty-one dash two dash eleven. Like, why is it not in here? It's outsourced to Lexus. The first link is the official code. Oh, this is official? What the fuck is Lexus? Oh, well, fuck me. Christ. Okay, Jesus. Okay. Ugh. Okay, title 21. And then 211. Preparation for the conduct of the primaries and elections. I'm not a bot, I swear. It looks like it, as if the previous memo was a guideline to pursue electoral changes legally. Yeah, that's what he's trying to do with this memo. He's trying to make the argument like, well, we could probably do this, but like all of this is, um, all of this is like, Ten U.S. at best. He's just trying to make the strongest legal argument to have these people not be committing perjury, essentially, when they're doing this. Okay. Twenty one two eleven. Twenty one two eleven. Judicial decisions, opinion notes. Am I can I just not read this? What is Title twenty one, chapter two, article eleven? Where is it? What is it? I don't want to see the annotations, I just want to see like the the I want to see the actual, the, the writing, the article itself. What, what is this? Is it this? Yeah, I guess it could be, but why am I why am I on these dot coms? I don't understand why Why is this not why does Georgia not host their legal code anywhere? I don't understand. Or maybe maybe states normally don't. Maybe it's just Arizona it's just whatever. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, maybe this is even a real state. Who the fuck knows? Okay, whatever. <sighs> okay. Presidential electors chosen pursuant to code section 21210. At the November election, okay, they shall be elected to the elector, electors of the state persons to be known as electors of president and vice president of the United States, referred to in this chapter as presidential electors, equal in number to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled to the Congress of the United States. Okay. 
at the November election to be held in the year 1964 and every four years thereafter, there shall be elected by the electors of this state, first to be known as electors of president and vice president of the United States, referred to in this chapter. Okay. Presidential election is chosen pursuant to code section 21210, 21211, 21 No, this is 21210. Does it tell you how they're chosen? Am I just fucking retarded? There shall be elected by this by the electors of this state, persons to be known as electors of president and vice president of the United States are referred to in this chapter as presidential electors. Equal and how do you elect them? There shall be elected by the electors of this state. How are the electors of the state chosen? Holy, holy fucking AIDS. Okay, whatever. Uh, the presidential elector, electors chosen pursuant to code section 21210 shall assemble at the seat of government of this state at 12 noon of the day which is or may be directed by the Congress of the United States and shall then perform their duties. If any such presidential elector shall die, then get fucked. You get $50 for every day spent in traveling to, remaining at, damn, 10 cents per mile. BZ, uh, BZ, uh. Okay, whatever. Christ, fuck. And he shot Rollo Sue's destiny? No, Rollo's fucking retarded. Okay. <sighs> okay, make this look nicer. Benoit, what do you want? Any, uh, um, yeah, I had a, uh, I was thinking about your, uh, like, these positions that you've been taking on the whole, um, uh, making fun of the firefighter thing. Sure. And I think that a part of, like, I think the reason why people feel like, well, okay, no, the reason why I feel like it's kind of wrong is because in an example where, like, if somebody points a gun at you and then you shoot them. I think that you could argue that you're not shooting them. You're, I mean, you are, obviously you are shooting them, but what you're doing is you're defending yourself. But like, if you baited somebody to point a gun at you so that you could get a free kill, right? Both of us would probably agree that that's something wrong, uh, that you did something wrong there. So it feels like in making fun of the firefighter dude, there's no like ulterior good thing that you're doing in response to it. You're just kind of doing it because you like to do it, which is why people feel like it's wrong. Yeah, yes, but I mean, like, there's a there's like a political benefit to like rallying your side and engaging in destructive rhetoric. This is why people do it is because it it galvanizes support um, for the people that support your party. Galvanize, right? Do you, do you feel like you're doing that, or that you were trying to do that when you did it? Um, so like, I think well, it was like more like shaming the other side, but it doesn't change what I'm saying. Like, there's a reason why people engage in rhetoric like this. Like, conservatives don't do it on accident, and. Like, they do it because it energizes the fuck out of them. It gives them a lot of conviction for the things that they believe in and everything. And you feel like they're doing the same thing? Uh, sure, yeah. Well, do, I mean, do you actually, or are you just saying that to see if I have a response to it? Uh, as opposed to what else? Yeah, basically, yeah. No, the, 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 what I said, like, you could just be doing it just because you, you want to be mean and cruel. Um, 
I, I guess that could be a part of it too, if you want it to be. I mean, like, I did consider it. I waited. I think I literally tweeted out that I had conflicting feelings about it, and I waited for a moment. And I thought about it. I was like, you know what? Actually, no. Yeah, fuck this. Um. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I maybe we might not be able to move past this, but it feels like your decision to go ahead with, you know, making fun of the dude and not being, uh, you know, considerate about it is that you were angry that people were criticizing you for that initial tweet that you made. Not that there was like... No, it wasn't. Wait, what? No, my issue was all the other communication, not the initial tweet that I made. It was all the other shit I was seeing blowing up. Like what? What other shit? All the people saying that, like, this is the result of saying that Nazis, every single, calling Trump a Nazi over and over again leads to rhetoric like this, and, like, all, basically, was blaming liberals for the fucking assassination attempt. Wait, even anybody knew what the fuck even happened. Yeah, but why do, if you have a problem with that, why does that mean that you have to make fun of the guy who died? It doesn't mean that. You don't have to, I guess. I was doing it because I thought it was funny. But the qu the question isn't, like, just making fun of somebody. The question is, like, should they get sympathy? That's, that's technically what the, um... But the original argument is about is whether or not somebody's deserving of sympathy or not. And if somebody's not deserving of sympathy, well, I'm fine. You make fun of you want. You don't think he's deserving of sympathy? Isn't that what I just said? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I guess. I was just clarifying, I suppose. And you say that he's not deserving of sympathy just because he forced Trump. Yep. Mm. Okay. Hey, I'm not. I'm not that mad at your position. I just. Um, I don't think that I would do what you did. But it's okay. Oh, actually, no. I had. A, I had a question about something else too. You were. Um. You were talking about like uh, the difference between deontology and like um, utilitarianism or consequentialism or something like that. Okay. And you were saying that um. A lot of deontologists try to escape deontology um, with like these kind of pseudo consequentialist uh, ideas. Sure. Uh, I wanted to know if you thought that if you think that and it, like this is an escape from deontology because I don't think it is. Um, I feel like a part of what it is that you do is the intent behind what you do. So, like, if you take the example of um, lying to a Nazi guard to, you know, protect the Jews that you're hiding in your home, I don't really view that as lying. I view it as protecting the Jews that are in your home. Aren't you telling a lie? Uh, no, I'm protecting the Jews that are in my home. Oh, okay. By lying, though, right? Um... I don't know enough about like, I don't have any formal background in ethics. So I'm not gonna be able to give you like substantial defenses of <laughs> of, of Kantian philosophy. That's, I, you, you're way better off going to the Plato Wiki or asking somebody that actually has like a formal education in this area. Okay. Cause I, I'm, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to help you that much, yeah. All right. But. Um, yeah. All right, I guess that's it. Okay, I love you, be careful. Bye.